So what I wanted to do today was a quick tour about what we have done in my lab in the last uh, five years. Uh, so a quick, you know, tour about neural network theory. So it will be on the same team than uh, Shagla presentation, but it will be a bit more basic object. Okay. And this is not working. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. So first, you know, what is machine learning? I mean, in fact, I took this uh, slide from uh, Martin uh, inaugural lecture some time ago. So machine learning is really like algorithm which we learn from data. Okay, you have a lot of data and you want to learn one algorithm. So one of the most famous examples could be spam detection. You have a lot of emails. Okay, so these are all my emails I'm receiving. It's from like maybe two years ago. It's a, you know, a slide we are using as an ML course. So you have a lot of email. Some of them will be some good email. Some other will be spam. What do you want to do? You want to learn a classifier which will detect when you receive an email. Is it a good email or a spam? That's a very simple problem. And this is what is about classification and machine learning. Maybe. Another problem, okay, this is really not working well. Yeah, but it's still, okay. Okay, anyway, so another problem is the image classification. So imagine you have a bunch of image, you have some image of some minions, you have some image of babies, what do you want to do? You want to classify. Okay, I'm giving you like a new pictures, you want to say, is it a baby or is it a minions? Okay, so this is what we are interested in my team. And of course, you have a lot of other application uh, which rely on classification and uh, machine learning and neural network and Shagla already talk a lot about them, so I will not go too much into details. But what is important to note is that, in fact, all this application at the core, they really share the same kind of foundation, and it's just that you have a bunch of training data, you have a bunch of pictures. Some of the pictures will be some minions, some of the pictures will be some pictures of the babies, but what you have to think about is that, in fact, all these pictures are some dot in your space, okay? The minions will be some red dot, the babies will be some blue dot. And so what are you trying to do? You are trying to find a function so that with this function, you will be able to categorize your pictures, okay? On one side of this hyperplane, you will have the baby. On the other side, you will have the minion. And so you are looking for the good hyperplane. When you are learning this hyperplane, you are separating babies from minion. I'm giving you a new picture. So you can just look at on which side are you of the hyperplane, and you can make your prediction. Okay, that's very basic, and that's what we are interested in. And so if we think about it, what is really the framework of supervised learning is exactly what I just explained to you. You have n observation, x i, y i. They are coming from some distribution rows that you don't know. And then you will consider some prediction function. So your function, your prediction function f, will be from the space of the observation to uh, your prediction, and you want to use this function in order to make some prediction. So what is the goal of supervised learning? is that using all your observation, you want to be able, when I'm giving you a new x, to predict its label. Okay, and this means that you just want to learn a function f, which will predict well. So this is what we see easily in this drawing. You have like, in the black cross, that will be your training data. And now I'm giving you a new point, a red point, and you want to associate the value with this point. Okay, so this is all about what is all about supervised learning. And so how you can do that, in fact, you can learn a function f star, which will minimize your true risk, okay? So what is a true risk? You want to make some prediction. You have x, you will predict f of x, but your true prediction was y. Then you will just compute the distance between y and f of x, and you want this to be small in average over all your point x and y. Okay, that's very easy. So you just want to learn this function, the function which will predict ideally, if you think about it. But the main problem is that you don't know the distribution row. Okay? So since you don't know the true distribution of the data, you cannot compute this object. So what we are doing instead, we won't compute the true expectation, but we will approximate it by the average over all your observation. Okay? 
and that's the empirical risk minimization. Now I have this function, which is a true function I can compute using my observation. Okay? And given this object, you have the two main questions behind theoretical analysis of supervised learning. The first question is, how can I minimize this object? How can I find a function f which will give me a small value of the train risk? And the second question, which is more related to statistics, which is, how can I know that this function will predict well? Because if you think about it, the function f I will get will only tell me something on the observation I have, and you want this to still hold on some new observation. Okay? So that's the goal. We have this objective, we want to minimize it. The problem is that doing minimization over the space of all the functions will be difficult. So what we are doing, we will consider some space of parameterized family of function. Instead of considering all the function f, I will consider the function parameterized by some vector theta. And now I will be happy because I can do minimization over some vector space. And you can consider some very simple problem, such as the linear prediction function, where your prediction f theta of x will just be x transpose theta. And you can also consider some very complex function, such as neural network. Shaklar talked a lot about it. Okay? So where neural network, you just have to think about it as some very complex parametric function, which can kind of represent any function with a lot of parameters. And of course, when you go down, you gain in terms of expressivity, so you will be able to learn some more complex function. But on the other side, you are also losing some simplicity, and the analysis will be more difficult. And so with my team, what we're often trying to do is to find a good trade-off, to find a good model, such that we can still analyze and derive some theory, but which are not too complex, so that the analysis is quite, is uh, still tractable. And so today, what we will do is that we will consider four different models, if we have time, from the simplest one to those which are using practice, and we will try to see what we can say. Okay? So I want to minimize my inference risk. I'm parameterizing my function by some vector theta. Now, how can I minimize my function? And so for that, I can use this simple ID. I would just follow the negative gradient direction. You know that the direction where the function will be decreased, and that's a very simple and old ID, which dates back to Cauchy in the 19th century. Okay, so you have your function L. You want to minimize it. You will just follow the negative gradient. This is giving you the gradient descent algorithm, but often in practice, in order to compute the gradient, you would have to compute this sum over the n observation, it would be too costly. And so instead, what you are often doing is that you are approximating this gradient by only one of the elements, or a mini batch of the element. And this is what is called the stochastic gradient descent algorithm. Okay? And as a theoretician, what we prefer to do is, in fact, to consider the gradient flow. So we are taking the st step size gamma, which is the size of the step you are doing, to zero, in order to have this simpler object for which we can do some uh, differential analysis, and it makes the proof simpler. And of course, in practice, what you are doing is that you are adding a lot of other uh, algorithmic components to this in order to obtain the state-of-the-art algorithm, which are really used in practice. But the core idea behind all this algorithm used in practice, even when you are thinking about ChatGPT, it's still gradient descent. Okay. So we have our train loss. We will minimize it with gradient descent, and we want to understand why we are obtaining a model which will still generalize well. And, anyway, and in terms of minimization, what you have to get, I mean, to keep in mind, is that the two main class of problem is, is your function convex or not? If your function is convex, then the problem will be easy to minimize. If the problem is non-convex, then the problem will be difficult because you can get stuck in some local minimum. So now we have everything kind of ready to set like the stage. What are like the three main questions we are interested in in theoretical deep learning? The first question is about expressive uh, power of neural network. Okay, why neural network can kind of learn, I mean, can approximate so well the function we are interested in? And then, in terms of optimization, why is it possible that our gradient descent algorithm is converging to a good solution? And then lastly, why is this good solution generalizing well? And so today, we will just mainly focus on the second and on the third question. Because what you have to keep in mind is that all these neural networks are highly overparameterized, so you have a lot of parameters. 
And so you can kind of fit all the possible observation. So if you think about it, there are a lot of different functions, okay, f theta, such that f theta of xi will be equal to yi on all your observation. So that means that the train loss will be equal to zero for a lot of different functions. And since the loss is positive, this will be minimum of your loss. So you have a lot of different minimizer of your loss, but they won't all generalize well. Okay, when you look at them on some new observation coming from the same distribution, not all the minimizer of the train loss will generalize well. And so what is happening in practice is that maybe one algorithm will converge to one solution, theta one star, which will have some specific structure, whereas another algorithm will converge to another theta two star, which will have a different structure, okay? And what we are trying to understand is that what is specific is it specifically the structure associated to the algorithm to understand why the algorithm used in practice are working well. Okay, and that's very important because if you look at this simple experiment, what you are looking at a, a picture data set with some uh, deep ResNet, you can see that all the different algorithms you can use will go to a minimum of the train loss. But when you compare in red the performance you obtain in the test, okay, the performance on some fresh samples, you see a lot of difference. So depending on the algorithm you are using, you will always minimize your train loss, but you will not converge to the same solution, and the solution will have different generalization property. To mainly uh, summarize what we have <coughs> seen so far, you have one training uh, data set, okay, this is your observation. Then you will consider a family of architecture, and then you will have a lot of different solution of your train <coughs> loss. And depending on the algorithm you are using in order to minimize this loss, some will converge to some solution which will not generalize well, and other algorithm will converge to solution which will generalize well. Okay, and this is what we try to see for four different family of models. And so we will start our tour with our first room, which will be about linear models, and as Rudiger introduced, about classical linear regression. Okay? So now my function f theta of x is just a linear function x transpose theta. I'm minimizing my square loss over my observation. And I can give you like the first and the simple result of the talk today. And I can even give you a proof. So both gradient descent and stochastic gradient descent will have the property that the gradient will belong to the span of your observation. Okay, and that's a very important property because that means that if you assume that you are converging to a solution and you are convex, so you will converge to a solution, then you know that in the limit, the limit will be equal to the initial point plus a vector which will be in the span of your observation. And that it is enough to imply this following result, which is possible to characterize where you will converge. And so you will converge just to the projection of your initialization onto the set of solutions. So maybe we can look at an illustration, it will be easier. So I have my space of dimension two. I will have in red the span of my observation. And in green, I will have the orthogonal of this space. And I'm starting from theta zero. And then what you will see is that gradient descent will follow uh, the direction of the span of x until reaching the space of the interpolating solution. Okay, and for stochastic gradient descent, even if you have some noise and you see some oscillation, you will still exactly follow the same direction until reaching the same point. And since you see that you have some uh, 90 degree angle between this direction between theta zero and theta infinity and the space of interpolation, you can directly characterize the limit. Okay, so you see that even for this simple problem, I'm doing linear regression with a linear model, I'm over-parameterized, okay, so I have less observations than the dimension of my problem. I have a lot of different solutions, okay, there will exist a lot of theta, such that L of theta is equal to zero. But then using gradient descent and stochastic gradient descent, I will converge to one very specific solution. And so this solution will correspond if you start from zero to the minimal norm solution. So in some sense, you can control 
the solution, you can regularize your problem, gradient descent will automatically converge to the mean L2 solution. But the problem is that often with linear regression, if you are over-parametrized in high dimension, this L2 geometry is not the good one. And what you will often assume is more that your ground truth will be sparse, and so you would like to converge to a mean L1 solution. That's the first point. And then the second point, we are not so pleased with this result because we don't see any difference between gradient descent and stochastic gradient descent. Whereas well, I don't know if you remember in the previous slide, I clearly have a difference in terms of performance if I'm using SGD compared to GD. So in order to investigate this point, we have to move to our second room and to consider a slightly more complex parametrization. So this will be a diagonal linear network, which are simple models we have intensely studied in, with my team in the past uh, three or four years. So what are linear, diagonal linear network? I'm still considering uh, my simple linear regression, but instead of considering beta, I will consider some parametrization of beta as the component-wise product of two vectors, u component-wise product with v. Okay? So instead of minimizing my problem over beta, I will minimize my problem over u and v. Okay? So I have u and v two vectors. My parameter theta are this vector uv, and I'm considering the linear prediction x transpose u times v. And so in terms of uh, theta, this is a non-convex problem. So even if I'm not gaining anything in terms of expressivity, I can only express some linear function. In terms of training dynamics, the problem will be totally different. Because now I'm minimizing some non-convex function. Okay? So it's a simple classical regression setting with a different reparametrization. And that's maybe one of the simplest problems for which we can uh, really observe some interesting phenomena, which are also observed in more complex architecture. Okay? And so what can we show for this diagonal linear network? So if you are considering the gradient flow, so you remember that the gradient descent algorithm, where you are taking the step size going down to zero, and you initialize your gradient flow at a scale alpha, okay, alpha would be the size of your initialization, then it's possible to show that the parameter, the limiting parameter beta alpha infinity, okay, the limit of your flow, will converge to a minimizer of your tra training loss. And there you have to realize that this is not obvious because you have some non-convex problem. So showing that gradient flow or gradient descent is converging to a global minimizer is something non-trivial. And even more, it's possible to characterize to which point you are converging. You are converging to the solution, okay, which corresponds to the minimum phi alpha of beta. Okay? And what is important about phi alpha is that it's some function. You can think about it as a norm if you want. And if alpha, your initialization scale, is small, then this norm will be close to the L1 norm. Okay? If alpha is large, then your norm will be close to the L2 norm. And so depending on the scale of the initialization, okay, depending on if you are starting close to zero or far away from zero, your algorithm will have a different implicit bias. If your initialization is small, you will converge to some small, uh, to the minimum L1 norm interpolator. If your initialization is large, you will converge to the minimum L2 norm interpolator. And in practice, often in regression, you want to converge to the sparsest solution. Okay? The sparsest solution is a solution where you have a lot of zero. Okay? And so using our diagonal linear network and starting close from zero, then you will converge to this sparsest solution. So you see that with this reparametrization, we have a better implicit bias. And then we can also consider what is happening for stochastic gradient descent. So you remember you are not following your true gradient, but you will follow some noisy estimate of your gradient. And so there what we were able to show is that if you start from the same initialization, you will still converge to a minimizer of your training loss, which will still correspond to one of the interpolator with the smallest phi alpha infinity potential. So it will be the same potential, 
But this potential will be evaluated in a different scale, alpha infinity, which is strictly smaller than alpha. So what you can show is that with stochastic gradient descent, if you were just doing gradient, sorry, if you were just doing the gradient flow, you will converge to some solution theta star gradient flow. If you are doing stochastic gradient descent, you have some noisy dynamic, but at the end, you will converge to a solution which will be closer to the minimum L1 norm interpolator. And so you can suspect that this solution will generalize better. So we can see a practical example. I have my training set in the first image. Okay. And I'm considering this ground truth distribution. And what I'm assuming is that, in fact, this ground truth distribution is uh, sparse under some representation. And then I will compare gradient descent and stochastic gradient descent, starting from the same initialization. And so you see that both functions at the end will exactly match your training point. Okay, so on your observation you have in your training set, you will exactly get a zero loss, but they will generalize differently. And you see that with SGD, you recover a function which is very close to your ground truth, and so you will have some good generalization property. Okay, so, so, so diagonal linear network are really like the simplest model where we can see this difference between GD and SGD and explain why SGD is uh, working better in practice. But if you think about it, we are still only doing linear classification and linear regression, and we are not, uh, and this is a class of model which is not very powerful. And so if we want to consider more powerful models, if we want to consider real neural network, we have to move in our third room, where we will really consider, now maybe the simplest neural network you can think of, it would just be a one hidden layer neural network with some real activation. <coughs> So what you have to think about is that this function f theta of x will just be some piecewise linear function, okay? Because you are adding this sigma, which is a nonlinear function, and by adding this nonlinear function, now you can express and you can learn a lot of different functions. Because you know that with piecewise linear function, you can approximate any continuous function. Okay, so we have a more general class of problem. We are still minimizing our square loss. But now the analysis, given this uh, activation function, will become far more difficult. And so in order to get some result, we have to uh, assume additional assumptions. So what will be our assumption? It will be that our input, xi, our observation, are orthonormal. Okay? It makes sense if you think about it, because in high dimension, if you take uh, some random observation, they will be very likely orthonormal. And so for this model, under this assumption, it's possible to show that your train loss, if you are doing the gradient flow, will converge to zero. Okay, so you are doing gradient flow on the train loss. You still start from your initialization scale alpha, that is kind of the size of your initialization. And so you will converge to some solution, theta star alpha, it depends on your initialization, which corresponds to an interpolator. And if you suppose uh, if you look at what is happening for small initialization, in fact, in the limit of alpha going to zero, you will converge to the minimal L2 norm interpolator. Okay? So for gradient flow, it's possible to show that your gradient flow algorithm will converge to an interpolator. Okay? If you think about it, that's also highly non-trivial because you have some non-convex loss. And even if you are not assuming that your observations are orthonormal, then you can have some counterexample, and you will not converge to a minimum. Okay, so you can show that you converge to a minimum. And if you take the limit of the initialization to zero, you will in fact converge not to any minimum, but you will converge to the minimum with the smallest L2 norm. Okay. So that's the first result. But you see that this kind of result does not really help us to make some distinction with stochastic gradient descent. Okay. But even to prove this result, what we had to do is that we had to totally describe the full trajectory of your iterate. So if you think about it, you want to show that you are converging to a global minimum. And what you have to do, you have, you have to understand the full trajectory. So that's something which is highly unusual in optimization. So I will, I will show you this uh, small animation, which explains what is happening during the trajectory. 
And this is exactly how the proof is working. So in green, we have our two point. Okay, I'm doing some regression in dimension one with two point. And in bl blue, you will have uh, the <coughs> cross which will correspond to the neuron. Okay? And the green line will be the function, the piecewise learning, piecewise linear function that we are learning. So in the first phase, what is happening? You see that all the neurons are not moving in norm, but are moving in direction, and they will align toward two directions. And then in the second phase, you will have one direction which will grow, okay? And this will help you to learn this new linear function, piecewise linear function you see in green, which will fit your positive point. And then in the last phase, the second cluster of neurons will also grow in norms, and this will enable you to fit your negative point. Okay? And so if you look at the proof, we are exactly characterizing this three phase. And this should show you that already for this very simple model, only trying to study gradient first, or even not gradient descent, or stochastic gradient descent, and we are assuming that all the observations are orthonormal, the proof is already highly non-trivial. So then when we wanted to move a bit beyond this, what we realized is that we have to kind of change the way we are tackling problem. And this is what we will do in the last room where we will really talk about real neural networks which are used in practice. Okay, so I will not talk anymore about regression. I will not talk anymore about, you know, small problem. I will really consider some very deep, or I mean some deep architecture, some ResNet. If you think about it, you have more than 10 power 7 parameters. And I will consider Cypher 10. Okay, it's a medium size uh, computer vision uh, data set where you have uh, 6, 10 power 4, 32 times 32 image in 10 different classes. So this is a more realistic problem. And so what we are trying to understand now is that why the algorithms which are used in practice are working well. So if you look at a general uh, trend that you can look when you are using gradient descent to minimize this problem, what do you observe? So for this, the step size would be very important. And so in practice, what people are doing is that you are first doing a very large step size, okay? And then at some point, you are decreasing your step size. And what we see is that during the phase where we are using a large step size, the train loss is staying constant. So the train loss is not decreasing. And then when we are decreasing the step size, the train loss is decreasing, and then the test loss is also decreasing. Okay? And so this is what we will try to understand in the last two slides. Okay, so why is there some loss stabilization? And why loss stabilization is leading to solutions which are generalizing in a better way? And is this related to the sparsity of your parameter, such as what we have observed for diagonal linear network? So the first phase is about loss stabilization. So if you compare um, what is happening for the gradient flow or for the stochastic gradient descent, you see that first the two loss will decrease. But then at some point for stochastic gradient descent in green, due to the noise and to the large step size, you will not be able to decrease your loss and you will stay stuck at some high level of your train loss. But you see that you are not converging to a zero loss or you are not diverging, you are just staying stuck. Okay? And so in fact, you are moving in a very precise direction. So you are moving toward the direction which is generalizing well. So you really see that the noise of HDD is helping you to drive your dynamics toward some very specific region which will generalize well. And so in order to understand this, you just have to look at how you can rewrite your stochastic gradient descent algorithm, and you will see that you will have your true gradient plus some noise. And this noise, in fact, will have a very specific geometry. Okay? So it will depend on the value of the loss, and it will be along the Jacobian, okay, the derivative of your model. And the two will be very important. So first, you see the importance of the loss stabilization. 
Because if your loss is going down to zero too quickly, then the noise will disappear. Okay, if L of theta is equal to zero, you don't have the positive effect of the noise. So that's why that loss stabilization to keep the loss at a high value is very beneficial because the noise will be very strong. And then you see that this noise depends on the Jacobian, so on the derivative of the model. And so in order to kill the noise, you will have to have a model which will have a low rank Jacobian. Okay? So you see that in some sense, the dynamics will sparse you toward, so it will drive you towards some sparse solution in terms of the Jacobian. And that's really what you can observe in practice. You see that the loss stabilization is helping you, and that the longer that you are stabilizing, the better the solution will be. Okay? And if you look in the last plot, in terms of the sparsity of the model that you obtain, you see that when you get stabilization for a longer time, then you converge to a sparser solution. And this sparsity is related to the generalization property. Okay? So in conclusion for this model, the noise of HGD is really helping you in order to converge toward some sparse solution, okay? which will have some good generalization property. So that's all, and we can conclude uh, our tour. So in order, just to summarize quickly what we have seen, in order to understand you know, the success of neural network in practice, it is very important to understand why these methods are converging why gradient descent are converging to a minimum of your train loss? That's the first question. And then, why do you converge to a minimum of the train loss, which is generalizing well? That's the second question. And then, to try to understand what are the important algorithmic uh, elements which is influencing this process. So, in the last two minutes, I would just want to show you some of you know, what we have in mind for the next years. And that will really relate with Shagler presentation. So it's really like, you know, can we move beyond more complex problems in order to understand and improve a bit generative AI model? And I mean, all the Shagler, all Shagler presentation was about that, but we all know that ChatGPT can do many impressive things. So that was Maxim, who was curious in 2022. Uh, he tested to see if ChatGPT was able to solve our ML exam. And it got some average results. So ChatGPT would pass the ML course of EPFL. So that's quite impressive. But then yesterday, I tried to see if ChatGPT was able to multiply two five-digit numbers. Okay? And so I'm asking not to use any external tools, otherwise it's too easy. Okay, I just ask ChatGPT, can you multiply this number times this number? And then you see that the model is giving you some results, it's making some computation. The model is thinking very hard, and it's giving you an answer. It's kind of proud of it. But at the end, if I'm just using uh, the calculator of my Mac, I see that the result of GPT is wrong. So it really shows you that these models are lacking some reasoning behavior. And that was very important uh, research direction. And then, as Shaglar explained, these models are also very well aligned with human values. Okay. So if you're asking ChatGPT to create some plausible news article that will cause panic, the model will tell you, I'm sorry, I cannot. Okay? This will be unethical. I won't be able to do that. Okay, but then, and that's current work also with Maxim, you see that this can be very easily attacked. So you can very easily find this adversarial suffix, okay? just like a small combination of token, you are adding it after your prompt, and then your model is giving you a fake article. Okay? I mean, the model is still apologizing if you think about it. It says that there is no uh, without creating actual false contained, but then the first line is totally creating something totally false. Okay? So you'll see also that alignment, which is maybe one of the most important directions for LLMs, are uh, not robust and not. Uh, optimal yet, and so there are a lot of future research to be done, and we are very well posed at EPFL with a lot of initiatives, so we so is a new AI center to make some great advancement in that direction. So that's all for today. I'm already a bit over time. I would just like to thank all the amazing team I'm working with during this past uh, five years, so it's always very great to have you around, and thank you all for your attention. Thanks. <laughs>